Okay, so ex expectations. I've got a quote from somebody, and there's some points if who, you can guess who, 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 uh, who quoted this, or who, whose words are these? It, se it says, expectation is the root of all heartache. Who said that? Anybody know? It shows you're quite educated, because I didn't know who it was, but um, 100 points if you can guess. Come on. Who said that? Expectation is the root of all heartache. Uh, William Shakespeare, that's William Shakespeare. So we could tell none of us are that well educated here. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. I went over, you know, it's not something you hear all the time. No, she went out. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> expectations. Do you know what? I really, God put this on my heart because I feel expectations in all of aspects of our life can be destructive, it can be positive, but it also can be very destructive. In the church, expectations has destroyed the church in many ways. Would anyone agree with that? Yeah. Expectations of, of our mind, expectations of what we see other people, or where we see other people. Um, and God's put on my heart, do you know what, we need to address our expectations in our lives and with other people. I've put on here, what happens when we have such high expectations of people, situations and goals and they are not met? What happens? Disappointment. Disappointment. Yeah, lows, disappointment, frustration, unhappiness, bitterness, worthlessness, sorrow. How many people of here have put so much expectation in another person only to realise they're actually a human being? Yeah? I, the reason I, I can praise God today, and I'm so thankful for what he's done in my life, I can stand here with my wife and my kids because he's such an amazing God. He's a miracle-working God. Do you know what? We've got expectations on people, and I expected a, you know, marriage to be one thing. She expected marriage to be one thing. And then when you realize that's not God's expectation, that's our expectation, um, yeah, you realize you're way off of the page in many ways. Um, and what God has taught me is, do you know what? Whatever you expect of somebody, look, look up, look up, look up all the time. I'm going to go through a bit of a, what it says in the scripture. But I just want to focus on human expectation and what it does. You know, I work in a prison system. Um, I praise God, I'm not actually work for the prison because I, I don't want to be actually working in that system. I, I work alongside of it for a charity and it's a real struggling system obviously we know that people do things they end up in a situation for a reason and punishment is a course they have to go through and I believe people should be separated from society at times especially if they're dangerous um, but many people in prison have had expectations of life or they've been let down because they haven't had a parent that's been there for them so their expectation is oh I just got to survive it's myself um, and they turn to uh, addictions there's lots of addiction in prison and again a lot of the root of it is because of expectations they've grown up in in a kind of belief system or in a situation which has governed their life so I, what what kind of determines our expectations lots of factors upbringing culture the, the worldly system you know we're kind of taught in from school, come on, you've got to do well at school, you've got to do really well at school, you've got to get a good job so you can get trapped in the worldly system, have a mortgage, <laughs> pay all your bills on time, you know, and I'm not, that's all good stuff by the way, I'm not trying to put that down, but you can see that's the worldly system, you know, we kind of, this is what we're sold. And if you don't quite fit into that, your expectations from society is, oh, you haven't really made it, oh, you're homeless, oh, well, yeah, well, you've messed that up, haven't you, really? Is that God's view on, our, on, on humanity? No, totally not God's view. So how does our expectations affect church life? And I think this is something that God's put on my heart because we've all got upbringings that are different. We've all got parents that are different. We've all got, I'll give you an example. When you get married, you find out that your wife is very different in her upbringing to you. And 
you don't always put the toothpaste back in the right place, that's just one example. And you don't always put the toilet seat down or, you know, or the other way round. The other way round, you know, you might like something cooked a certain way and they might not be very good at cooking it that way, put it, let's put it uh, mildly. But, uh, yeah. Or, you, or the other way around, I might not be very good at cooking generally, so you get the idea. But we kind of go into a relationship with our friends, with our with our husbands, wives, our partners, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever it is, with all these expectations of how it should be. And uh, I want to speak to all ages, but I want to speak to the young people as well. You know, look at what God's expectations are for a situation. Um, sometimes you do have to go for a learning curve, unfortunately, and it's taken me a lot of years to really focus on what God wants in a situation. We do have to go through trials at times, and God allows that to change our character. But be really careful of what our expectations are of people, and especially in a relationship. My advice is make sure, as much as possible, that that other person's expectations line up with God's word. Because if you've got that foundation, then that helps so much. Um, That's for free, you can have that. But uh, yeah, expectations. Traditions. Here's another one. Traditions. The traditions of church aren't always, aren't always godly. Do you know that? Just because on a certain day of the year we've always done this and we've always done that doesn't make it godly. In fact, Jesus came along and he, they said to him, is it right to heal somebody on the Sabbath day? And he just, he, he, they just healed him. And he said, oh, would you go to your sheep or you go to your son in a time of need? He was basically saying, when the need arises, I do this because I have a care for that person. I will, I will, I will break that kind of that thinking. So sometimes I think we need to really be careful in a church situation, in a work situation. I'm talking mainly at church now. Is what, is, what is God's expectation of this church? Is it that on a Sunday we do this, this, and this, tick the boxes, and we go home, job done, thank you God, we're blessed, off we go. See, what we've got to be really careful of, that's our expectations of what God wants. Not always what God wants, you know, I'm so grateful we're in a church where, you know, it's smaller, we can kind of, we're a family, and we can work on stuff, we can try things, we can go, ah, that didn't really work, that worked, you know, and that's the idea. It's being a family. I'm going to get onto that a bit later on. But we've got to be so careful of all these expectations we have on people. Because they will let us down. Um, Unfortunately, because, guess what? They're sinners. They're humans. Every one of us here will let each other down. We try not to. I've let Mike down already this week. And he'll find out later on. Because I said to him, I said to him, this week, Mike, oh, I will put something on YouTube for you, so it's on there. And I've forgotten about it until I got to the back of the church. But, praise God, Mike will go, oh, I probably thought you'd do that anyway. <laughs> but, you see, he's got an expectation that I'll let him down. So, straight away, he's not too... No, I will definitely get round to that, Mike. Apologies. But, you see, our attention is, oh, yeah, I'll, oh, yeah, bless you, brother, I'll do that this week. Yeah, will I? Yeah, yeah, I will do. But the idea is, you know, you've got, and you can build up people's expectations. Control. Now, here is something that can destroy people, destroy churches, destroy so much. Because a person, who's, a person who lives a life expecting to control the situation is a destructive force. I know many people here that have been in that situation. You only got to get a boss at work that is so all about control do it my way. No, don't think, don't use your brain. It's my way or the highway kind of thing. And it destroys everything. You end up with a work environment where nobody wants to work there. They all leave. And then the person is still left thinking, oh, well, next lot of employees come in and the same thing. Happens. I've, I've been there. I've seen it so many times. Uh, marriages. Control is destructive. There's a balance in all these things. You know, we've got to be sensible. We've got to kind of find the balance in line of someone says, oh, I think we should do this and go with that, and oh, that's a good idea. Someone might be indecisive. I used to be indecisive, but now I'm not so sure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you get the idea. So, um, yeah, someone needs to take the lead and say, right, this is what... And the biblical model is that 
God says, look, the man has a bit of responsibility there. Sometimes, though, sometimes the wife hears from God and the man doesn't want to. I know, no, this is the way. And the wife will say, no, I think God's saying this. And you need to pray about it and work on it. Um, but the biblical model is, is, you know, God puts responsibility on the man to take the lead. And that's right. So we've got to be really kind of understanding uh, of these kind of situations and get that balance. But again, expectation. So that we were talking about control, wasn't it? The control of domination. You know, when you look at the biblical pattern, there's no domination. There's God at the top and there's you underneath. There's someone who can be seen as like responsible for the family, but they work together. It says, husbands love your wife. Um, remind me of the, the right, as the church. No, let's get it right way right now. As Jesus loves the church. Yeah, and, and wives love your husband. So the, it's like this kind of triangle, isn't it? We've heard it, and, and the rope this bound together. It's like e- equality. That's the idea behind it. Okay, so expectation. We're doing a lot of talk about... Oh, no, actually, I want to read one more thing from here. This is what the Psalm 118 says, verse 8 to 9. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. You could put governments, the royal family, whoever. You know, there's people out there and they've lost trust so much in the system. They've lost it. You know, they think, oh, politicians, oh, they're all corrupt. Not all of them are corrupt, but unfortunately the majority have made it bad for the others. The government, oh, where's, you know, we've all been there. Oh, they're spending all the money on building metro systems, but look at the hospitals, and we all kind of see the frustration in it. But who trusts in them? I don't trust in them. Definitely do not. Trust in humans. Now, this is a difficult one, because on the one hand, the Bible says, you know, we're a family. We, can, we all work together. You've got your job. You've got your job. But on the other hand, he's saying, well, don't trust humans. And I think what... If you look through the stream of the Bible, what he's trying to say is, put me at the top. Put me at the top. Don't put your hope in sinners because they're going to sin. You know, it's quite straightforward. It's such a simple concept, but we find ourselves bound by people's words, by bad people's actions, and our belief system, our upbringing of how they should act. I'll give you an example with me. Sometimes I'll be like... I'll be at a gig, everyone knows I'm a musician, I'll be loading up my car with all the speakers and I'm traipsing it all around, and I'm thinking, oh, God, if that was me, I'd be, you know, this is to Kelly or to whoever's near me, I would pick up something and I would put it in the car and say, hi there, do you want a hand? Oh, yeah, and other people in the band. But you know, you're there, like, open a door, trying to kick the door open, trying to get it through like this. But my expectation is, oh, I'm, pol- I'm a polite person, I look out for other people, see if they need a hand. They're just thinking, oh, i just got to get to do what I do. Kelly's probably thinking, i got to feed the kids or whatever it is. Or she just wants to sit there. No, no. No, she doesn't. That's not true. She's normally out when I'm loading up the car. But yeah, you get the idea. I've got this expectation of how things should work out. And every one of us brings that into church. And I want to say that we need to really, 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 really put a focus on God. Because if our expectation is to come here and have somebody say the right word to you at the right time in the right way, you're deluded. Because it ain't going to happen, unfortunately. Yes, we should try. I'll get onto this. We should try our best to, to, um, to love each other. I'm gonna, I don't want to give it too much away because this is a scripture we get onto. But what I'm trying to say is our expectation of what we, should, what we should get from other people should be gracious. We should say, ah, well, they're a sinner just like me. They're just the same as me. They're going to make a mistake. So when it goes a little bit wrong, or somebody hasn't put a video on YouTube, this is really, I, I designed this whole sermon just so that Mike won't be upset with me later on. I thought, how can I do that now? Okay, let's get to the point then. What does God expect from us? What does he expect from me? What does he expect from you? Any ideas? It's really simple, actually. I'm sure you, I'm sure you know this, but I just want to highlight it. The first thing he expects from us, do you know what? It's so great. From 613 come out, you know, laws, straight to two. Two. This is what God expects. Jesus, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first greatest commandment. 
There you go. That's what God expects from us. Put him in every situation. You know, when you're struggling with your job, when you're struggling with your marriage, when you're struggling with finances, when you're struggling just generally, what does he say? Love me, put me first in your heart, your soul, your mind. And so often we stray from that idea. Why is it that something so simple, we just go, ah, that's too, I can't bother with that. Well, because in our, in our head we think, actually, it's not that easy. No, you don't understand God, it's complicated, and I've got to get my justice. I have to go through this process, and I have to... You know, we do have to go through a process at times, because as humans, our minds are, unfortunately, human in that they kind of don't repair that easily. Sometimes you have to grieve a situation. Sometimes you have to um, understand the situation. You have to mature, and God, God works with you on that. But if we put, put him first in the situation, he can speed that up. I can totally, 100% say this morning that God can repair the mind. Totally. I've, I've come from a place of complete brokenness. And many people that know me know that. I've come from a place where my, my world basically just... You know, you get to 30-something, you think you've got this little empire or you've got this worked out, but I, had, I didn't have anything worked out. I just worked out that actually I needed God more than anything. More than anything. Because, you know, there's lots of things said, and especially within a marriage situation, the, the promises you make when you get married, you think that, oh yeah, I'm going to stick to that. And I believe I did stick to it. But unfortunately, things go wrong at times because I'm a human, my wife's a human, and things get messed up. But praise God, look, look at the result. We're in the same church together, and we're you know, God's building things again. Um, I don't have to go into too much detail. Many of me know, you know me, you know the situation, but praise God for what he's done. Okay. Put God in every situation. I want to read from Ecclesiastes. It says this, Accept the way God does things. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? In other words, he's allowed us to become crooked through free will, but accept the way that he's done this. You know, through Adam, we, you know, my, my, my lad, he's got a great, you know, Jayton, he's got a great answer for when he does something wrong. Oh, it's Adam and Eve's fault. I thought, what a great answer. It's Adam and Eve's fault, Daddy. I said, no, no, you've hurt your brother. Adam and Eve's fault, that is. I said, no, yeah, it is, but you've got free will. I thought he's quite switched on at times. I'm like, oh, I should have used that one. Yeah, but yeah, so I said, yes, it's Adam and Eve's fault that we've got this sin situation, but the free will, it's free will that's the problem, because we've got a choice. I've got a choice today. I've got a choice to love my brothers and sisters, to love my wife, or love my mum when she butts in. Yeah. The devil made me do that, yeah. Yeah, that's true. And that was the truth, Mum. <laughs> That's how connected I was. No, not to the devil, no. Uh, I did like fire. I got to admit, I had an obsession with fire. And I'd often burn myself. And I had a situation once where I ended up with no eyebrows. And my eyelashes were gone and half my fringe. But definitely wasn't my fault, that one. So, enjoy good times while you can. But when hard times strike, realize that both came from God. Remember that nothing is certain in life. Nothing is certain in life. You know, you could think, oh, I've got, I've got my savings, I've got my job, I'm, yeah, look at me, I, I'm sorted now. I'll tell you what, it only takes one financial crash, and you realize <laughs> you're just a little nothing, really. But in God, that's not the case. What he's trying to say is, when things are good, you know, when you've got good health, and when you're able to do stuff, easier, enjoy that. But when the hard times strike, realize that both came from God. God has to allow us to be human. He allowed Jesus to be human, yeah? Jesus was 100% man, 100% God, the strangest concept ever. But he had to be a human. He had to experience what we experience. So when people say to me, why does God allow that? He allowed his son to be human all the way through the process and feel the pain of death on a cross. So there's no get out, really, in my opinion. He allowed that to happen. He allowed God to be human. The strangest concept, but such an amazing concept. Thessalonians. 
Always be joyful. Now, this is a hard one. I'm, I'm standing here before you to say, I've not sorted all this out. God's working on me constantly. I was going to stand up and say, hi, my name is Rob, I'm a sinner. Because at the end of the day, that's true. Well, that's what I am. I'm nothing special, I'm just a sinner. But God's put this on my heart this morning. Always be joyful. <laughs> I don't know what's happening in the morning. Right? Never stop praying. Yeah, that doesn't always happen. Be thankful in all circumstances. Do you know what? I can say three years ago, four years ago, I was not happy. I was not ha- How could I be thankful in this situation? For me, there was nothing to be thankful for. It took me a while to get to the point to thank God, but now I'm standing here saying thank God for what I've been through because he's, he's taken me from what I thought to where I am now. And I needed that to, to grow my walk with God and, and realize I had to get closer to him. In a way, he allowed the situation for maturity and he will do that like that other scripture said. Oh, okay. I've put it. That's a real challenge. But if he is number one, it changes our heart, our perspective on a situation with the help of the Holy Spirit to guide us. We need the Holy Spirit in this. That's why salvation is crucial. You know, we can know of a God, but without the Holy Spirit in us, guiding, correcting, pointing out things. Oh, Rob, you said that yesterday. Don't do that again. Don't say that again. That's, that's the kind of conviction in you, the Holy Spirit working. You know the Holy Spirit's working in your life when things pop up and you go, oh, yeah, I've got to deal with that. Lord, I'm trying, I'm trying, I keep doing that. But you know it. it can, it's a conviction inside. You know the Holy Spirit's working. Right. Now we're going to get on to the church and the bigger aspect of that. So that's your walk with God and how that works out. What's the other thing he expects of us? You remember the first one? I'm sure many of you know the second one. Absolutely. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is also just as difficult, but you notice how he says this one is equally as important. So loving your God is equally as important as loving your neighbor. So you can't just, you can't just take one away. You can't just say, well, I'm going to love the Lord, but... God, that guy who does my head in, you know, whoever it is at work or whatever this is, no, nah, no, nah, forget that. God's saying, no, it's equally important that you, you, you understand both of these things. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? Is it just that person that you live next door to? Nope. Is it just, that's the only version I can think of. Is it just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it, uh, yeah. Basically, your neighbor is someone that's anyone that's close in your life, anyone that's close to you during your daily life. That's your neighbor. It could be someone in a shop and, and you start up a bit of a conversation. That's, that's your neighbor. Now, this is really interesting. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. But basically, what it's trying to say is this is what, this is what God set up from the start, right from the Old Testament love your God. Do all of these things and he put there do you know there's in those 613 laws there's actually so many kind laws about how to treat poor how to deal with debt you know we've got this kind of perception that the god of the old testament is all hell thunder destruction he's not he's just the same as the old testament he is the new testament you just got to really look into it but there's so much about looking out for each other looking out for the poor you know the, the cancelling of debt if a family gets in severe debt, it's cancelled out. And do you know what? The, our, our financial system would be so much better if it was based on that. Because you would never have a loan longer than seven years for a start. There would be a payment structure. And if you got into real difficulties, after 50 years, wipe it out. So you see there's a real difference with how God deals with humans and how we deal with each other. So let's bring it on to um, how we should act and how we should treat each other because this is what God's really put on my heart for myself because when you're in a position of, um, I'd say, reaching out to people in my job, uh, many of you know I do music here, um, and I, you, you're dealing with your brothers and sisters on a weekly basis and the more and more contact you have together, the more you bang against each other and the more you've got this expectation of how they should be and what they're doing and oh we've got this practice and I you know no one's turned up yet or you know that, that simple little things like that and that's our upbringing all those other things our belief system of how it should be that all creeps in and we all do it 
But let's read. Uh, get this Bible. Did I not have it written out? I'll just read Romans first then. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbour, you will fulfil the requirements of the law. That's again going back to the other one which he says, love your neighbour, all this. He's, he's kind of reaffirming what Jesus' words were. But I need to just get to Ephesians 4 a second. I thought I had that one set out, but I haven't got that one set out. Ephesians 4, verse 17. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as Gentiles do, for they are hopeless, uh, hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness, and they waver far from the life God gave, gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. We live in that age. Close their minds and harden their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. We see that all around us right now. But it goes to show it's not changed much from, from those days as well. Um, but that isn't what you've learned about Christ. Since you've... Since you've Sorry, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Okay, now this is our responsibility. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbours the truth, for we all are all part of the same body. And don't, sin, don't, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good work. And then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful. So that your words can be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved in the day of redemption. Get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behaviour. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, uh, through Christ, has forgiven you. There you go. That, you can't really go much can't get away from that, can you? All those kind of things. So my heart really is to say this morning, all of those expectations that we can have, sometimes we have to understand there is a, there is a, a right expectation as well from God's word, and that's based on God's word. But how we deliver that is crucial. You know, when it says about anger, be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God. You know, it, it's showing, you know, don't have rage. And that's how we know when we're working how God wants us to work. We, you have the fruits of the Spirit in the situation. Because God has said, look, this is my way. Stick to it. I just want to lay out one more thing. Do you know God has a model for how he wants us to deal with each other in church? And I don't know if many churches even bother to, to talk about this model. Uh, and I don't know if many churches really practice it. In fact, I've never really, I've not heard it talked about, but maybe it has been. I, obviously, I've not been to every church, so it's a bit of a statement. But I don't know if many really teach this. But it's quite straightforward. And I'm going to lay it out very quickly on here. And it's, you might already know this, but for the younger ones here and for us older ones as well I really think this is what God's saying this year we need to get this into, into motion we need to start using it more because it's crucial um, because when new people come through the door if we have this foundation laid when they come in with their, their issues which they will have because do you know what 
they're humans and sinners <laughs> just like us. We have to have this in place because we have to have a system to deal with it. And the best way to deal with it is God's way, through the Bible. That's why we've got this. We're so blessed to have a, a faith that's based on something substantial. Do you know, there's so many wishy-washy belief systems out there. Oh, well, I was walking down the road and I made up this new religion called, I don't know, whatever it is. And it's all wishy-washy. You can just change it. Oh, I adjust that today. I didn't work out that idea. But we've got something that, that you know, comes from history to the present, and it all fits together. It's, there's only one faith like this, and that's, that's Christianity. You know, from the beginning of time, there's an outlay of, oh, here's man's problem. How do we deal with the problem? Well, obviously, sin was a problem. Oh, I deal with it. I send my son. That solves the issue. It answers the problem of where we're going, why we're here. You know, it's such a great truth, is the truth. Okay, so let's get back to the point, Rob. It says, if a believer sins against you, sins against you, upsets you, kind of says something that you've taken the wrong way, uh, you get the wrong end of the stick, or if they're just really being nasty to you, whatever it is, go privately and point out the offence. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won the person back. So first of all, what do you do? You don't make a big song and dance. You go to them privately. It says privately. It doesn't say in the middle of the room, Oi, yeah, yeah come here, we'll sort this out. You know, it's, it's like, I'm going to take them to the side where no one else can hear. And you say, look, look, brother, look, sister. That thing you said where you didn't like my shoes, that really upset me. I love these shoes. I might not have cleaned them, but, you know, I do like these shoes. Whatever it is, you get the idea. You go to them. That was, um, that was being a bit trivial, but yeah. You go to them and you say privately, look, can we sort this out? I really feel like God wants us to get this sorted. If you're coming from a place where you've, you, you've taken the initiative, obviously there is, there's also responsibility on them at that point. But if they listen and they confess it, you have won that person back. Now, but if you are unsuccessful, take one or two with you and go back again so that everyone, uh, you, everything you say will be confirmed by two or three witnesses. I think it's quite important that you have two or three witnesses that aren't your best mates at that point, that you get some people that are kind of away from the situation. So they could go, oh, okay, let's see what's going on here there. And I think that really applies as well if you get two people that can't agree who's in sin there, who's done the wrong thing. You know what I'm saying? Because you might think you don't think wrong, they might think you have, or you think you're, you, that you're all right, and they, you, know, you get that situation where you both think you're right. That's a classic human trait, that is. I'm not wrong, you're wrong. No, you're wrong, I'm right. So get some witnesses, some godly spiritual people involved and say, right, let's just work through this. Okay. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if she or he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat the person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. And I think this is ex this, the extreme end, the extreme end. If you've got somebody that's destroying the peace, the unity, and all they care about is their point and destruct, causing destruction, bring them in front of the church and say, right, okay, what's your issue here? Let them speak it out, and then as a, as a body of Christ, you can all say, well, I think we should uh, pray about that. I think that's way off, and you can bring scripture into it. But at least then, there's nothing hidden. It's all out in the open. No one can say, oh, well, they said that, and of course. And nine times out of ten, somebody who's not walking in sync with the Lord won't even stand up because they don't want the embarrassment of saying what they've said behind closed doors at times. But you see how it takes, it's quite a, it's quite a, quite, when I read the kind of send them out, that's quite a shock. But how many churches really follow this that you know of? Who really does? But you know what? Not that we don't love that person, but they need to be able to show that if it's not done in a reasonable way, if they're allowed to just carry on acting the way they are without a responsibility, there needs to be a bit of a consequence because God has an expectation. If we get rid of our expectations, we'll get rid of the way we think it should be and we have to put it on to God because we might be wrong. The leadership might be wrong at times. You know, that's one crucial thing. It has to be based on the word of God, not just opinions. And there's so much in here about how a church should be and how it should be run. It has to be based in the Word of God. Okay, so that's just a way of dealing with 
a situation which I think God wants to highlight for us. The other thing is, how do we deal with non-Christians when they come in? How do we act to them? It's slightly different for non-Christians. Let's put it here, Romans, okay, Romans 12, 12 to 21. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. You notice there's a theme there. Be patient, keep praying, keep with it, keep sticking through it. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. See, God talks about loving each other. Be there to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Hospitality, sorry. Hospitality. Hospitality. Yeah, always be ready to love, to show care. Never be angry. You know, you, get, you can see God's heart here. It's don't be angry. Don't be bitter. Be there to help. Be there to come alongside people. Bless those who persecute you. So those out there that really can't stand the fact that we have this faith and that we say it's the way, the truth, and the life, don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who are weep. So, you know, when you... When you, you come alongside people in the church, if they're, having, you know, if they're happy and joyful, celebrate that joyfulness and kind of, you know, see that they're happy in that time. With those that are going through a situation, come alongside them. Don't leave them aside and say, oh, I, yeah, I can't, can't deal with that today. You know, make an effort to sort of kind of be a, be a body. There are some people that are really good at those situations and they know that God's used them for certain times and so, yeah. I think God highlights that in your heart. You're like, yeah, I think it's time that I go and speak to that person or do that for that person. So, you know, there's wisdom in that. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. The company of ordinary people. So kind of like, don't think, oh, well, we're, you know, we're above that, we're Christians and... Yeah, we don't need to be around. I mean, some, there are some setups which are kind of like, think they're holier than thou, and they kind of won't mix. In fact, the, the Bible's full of helping the needy, helping the poor, open up the doors. Jesus' example of the feast, you know, all the people that were too busy doing everything because they had to sort out their field or get their cows sorted or whatever it was. He's like, no, open up the doors, go to the hedges. He says, says go into the hedges. So people that are... And why would you be in a hedge? You have to be in a bit of need if you're actually living in a hedge. So he's basically saying, go and find those people that are in need and stuck in whatever they're in. And that's what we've been doing, obviously going out and preaching the gospel. Uh, and don't think you know it all. I think sometimes as Christians, we do think we know it all. But when we approach people, we can say, look, I don't have all the answers at times, but I can point you towards God and you can trust in him. You know, when we, when we meet people on the streets and they'll come up with these kind of questions and you think, no, I, I don't know the answer to that. Just say, but I can tell you one thing, God in my life is such a miracle worker. You know, he's changing me from the situation I'm in to where I'm now. He's such a powerful God, even if you don't know the answers. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. So don't premeditate in your mind, oh, well, that person, oh, yeah, oh, they've really annoyed me. I'm going to kind of find a sneaky way to get them back and they'll never know. You know, it's basically saying, don't have that, pre you don't have that set up in your mind if they're a non-believer or a believer. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Okay, so that's... You get the idea of what he's saying there. Uh, one more scripture just to end on there. This is for us as a body. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believes... Another believer is overcome by some sin. You who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Gently and humbly. 
It keeps as a reoccurring theme in the Bible, isn't it? gently and humbly. Not that you don't. You don't just say, oh, well, yeah, get on with that and kind of we won't rock the boat. It says, help them come back gently and humbly. So there's a, there is a responsibility of believers to keep our eye out. And that we have to understand that God's got expectations of how we should live. He's given us his word. We can, we can base on that. So Rich has done a whole talk on the don't judge me or, you know, it's not saying don't judge me. It says be aware of the sin, but how we deal with it should be very patiently in a godly way. Uh, in a gentle, humble, humbly, sorry, help that person back into the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So he's, like, it's being highlighted, look, you're just the same sort of kind of sinner. You can easily end up in that place. So help them because you're more spiritually aware at that point. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important, poor, sorry, too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Again, who's important? God. He's, he's the important one. We're just being used by him in all situations. We want to be used by him. So he's saying, yeah, put yourself in that situation. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we each are responsible for our own conduct. So yeah, be careful of what we're doing. You know, when I'm doing the worship up here, am I con and I've done this, don't get me wrong, I've done this. I'm quite, I could sometimes, because you're looking out, you're like looking around, are they singing? Are they singing? No, they don't want to sing. Okay, con I, I need to concentrate on what I'm doing. I need to think, Lord, you've put me here and you've asked me to do this. This is a gift that you've given me and I'm just going to worship you this morning. You know, forget what's going on. Let's just worship God and, and everyone's got their own responsibility. And whatever we're doing around the church, yes, obviously we want people to get involved and to be part of it and we are body working together. That's what we're trying to encourage. But at the same time, we have to focus on what God's asked us to do and just keep going with that. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing good things with them. So those that you feel are, are leading this place, provide for them, you know, look out for them. See what their needs are, it, not just monetary, spiritually. Oh, I'm praying for you in this situation ahead. Oh, you know, thank you for the, what you're doing. You know, it kind of like keep an eye on them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You are always... Um, you will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from the sinful nature. But those who live in peace, uh, sorry, live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, when, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. So there's an exception to do exceptionally more for those that are in this place. So in summing up this message, I just want to say thank you, brothers and sisters. You know, there's been so many prayers for me in my life from many of you over, the, over many years, but especially the last four years, I know so many people have said, oh, I've been praying about the situation and... And you know what, that is looking out for your brother or sister. And I've, I've been so blessed by so much encouragement of friends and kind of prayers that have gone, gone out. But my, my kind of summary would be, let's really evaluate our expectations in, in our friendships, our marriages, and in church. It, I'm really applying it to a church, I guess, today. Because what we can expect of each other might, not, might be unrealistic, it might be just our upbringing and the way that we see things should be that dictate, dictate that and not what God wants. Um, so let's just, let's just pray a second. Yeah, thank you, Lord, that we are um, we're a, fam a body of Christ in this place, Lord, and you've put us here in, in, this, in this part of the city, Lord Jesus, and there's a work to be done. And I really feel, Lord, that you've put this on my heart because... You want this place to grow. You want new believers to come through. And you want the attitude, the expectation um, to be of you, Lord. And that the way we treat each other is, is 
from the Word of God and how we deal with issues, Lord, all from the Word of God, Lord Jesus. So I just pray in the, in the weeks ahead, months ahead, Lord, that we would really focus on what, what is a realistic expectation of each other and how do we go about exercising those fruits of the Spirit in the time ahead. And Lord, we do want more of you. I know for myself, even in a busy week, I think I, I just haven't given enough time. I haven't sought you enough. And I know that's something you've you put in my heart, Lord, and many others here. So we just pray for my brothers and sisters, my family, Lord. Thank you for them. I just pray that this week they can go out, in, out into their lives, Lord, and just kind of put you first in those situations, Lord. When we meet our neighbour, Lord, that we remember this, what we've heard and, and the scriptures. It's, a lot of us know this stuff, but it's great to be reminded of just how your heart is for other people and how we should be to each other, Lord. So I just pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.